This program is made possible by the friends and partners of Unspeakable Joy TV. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When you come to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians is a follow-up letter that the Apostle Paul writes to that church at Corinth. Now, if you were going to put a church on the trophy case, it would not have been the church at Corinth. In fact, the church at Corinth was that church that nobody wanted to talk about, nobody wanted to claim membership at, nobody wanted to be associated with. Paul had seen that church birth, and Paul had seen that church blessed, but somewhere along the way after Paul left, that church lost its ever-loving mind. It got so bad at the church at Corinth that the Apostle Paul writes the first letter back to the Corinthians, and it's one of those what I call in North Carolina a come-to-Jesus moment. How many of you remember them come-to-Jesus moments when your mom and daddy said, we're going to have a little situation if we don't deal with this? In fact, I do believe that our nation might be helped out a little bit if we had a few more come-to-Jesus moments, but that's neither here nor there. And Paul writes to them, and he says, look, he said, I'm not going to joke around about this. I'm not going to play around about this, but there is a mess going on down at the house of God, and we need to get it taken care of. He said, the first thing you got going on is you got a sin problem. He said, you got a man living in the church, living with his own stepmother in immorality and in sin, and instead of dealing with it, you let him come in and sing specials on the stage and act like nothing's wrong. He said, here's what you need to do to that brother. He said, you need to deliver that man to the devil for the destruction of the flesh because people out in the world don't even act that way, and you're claiming claiming to be the bride of Jesus Christ and you're letting that kind of foolishness go on in the house of God. He said, you better get it dealt with because God is done playing around. Time out. Let me take one of my three allotted timeouts in this service. I know we're in 2023. 2024 is right around the horizon. I know we live in a society that got woke up, but it may want to go back to sleep because right is still right. Wrong is still wrong. Good is still good. Good, bad is still bad, sin is still sin, and righteousness is still righteousness. It is still right to do right. It is still wrong to do wrong. And the church of Jesus Christ is to be the beacon of right in the day that we live. I don't care who the person is related to. I don't care how much they tithe to the church. I don't care how good they can sing. I'd rather have Sister Ethel that couldn't carry a tune in a bucket but knew the power and righteousness of Jesus Christ than Brother So-and-so that had 15 degrees but was dirtier than a junkyard dog. You know why? Because the Holy Ghost will baptize Sister Ethel in the power of God. And he ain't going to touch brother so-and-so. I don't care if he's got enough degrees to be a thermometer. Because God will never pour holy oil into an unholy bucket. That's not the way God operates. He never has and he never will. Paul said, get that junk cleared up, cleaned up, and taken care of. He said, the second problem you got going on is in regards to the Lord's Supper. He said, instead of it being a holy festival, a holy ceremony where you remember the sacrifice of the Lamb of God with the shedding of blood by partaking in the cup and the breaking of the body in the, in the bread that you partake in, he said, you've turned it into a potluck and everybody's gone down. And instead of it being a righteous thing, it's become another ho-hum festival in the place of God. Ladies and gentlemen, specifically the Lord Lord's Supper, but as a general practice, the house of God is not to be another place in the community. It's to be the place where the righteousness of Jesus Christ 
gathers together so that the people may know that there is a God in it. This is not just another meeting of a bunch of people that are religious. Honey, this is a meeting of blood-bought, spirit-baptized, Holy Ghost-empowered people that have come for a purpose, and that is to lift up the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We didn't gather together because we're religious. We didn't gather together because we didn't have anything else to do on a Tuesday night. We gathered together because we believe that there is one way to heaven and only one way to heaven and we want to declare it far and wide that Jesus Christ is the only way. He said the third thing you got going on is you have made a bad practice of operating in the spiritual gifts. He said you have used the giftings of the Spirit to bring confusion in the body of Christ. Let's just put it like this. They was a whole lot going on down at the church at Corinth. And so Paul writes that first letter and he says you need to get it right. And thanks be unto God, they got it right. They turned the ship around. And Paul writes 2 Corinthians as a follow-up letter in order to encourage them. They got it right. Now you need to keep it right. Ladies and gentlemen, a church will always have a moment in its history where things go awry, where things get sideways, and you've got the choice. Are we going to let go on what's going on, or are we going to clean up the things going on in the house of God? And Paul said, you got it right. He says in 2 Corinthians, now let's keep it Right, because the devil will never be happy when the church is doing what it's supposed to do. Whenever the churches operate like the church is supposed to operate, the devil is not going to be happy. I was down here just yesterday, and I was meeting and got to see some of those precious people packing all of those Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. Thousands and thousands of children that are going to get to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ because you have done that. Don't let the devil make you think that doesn't matter. Jesus said, if a small cup of water is given in my name, you will receive a reward. And Jesus is going to bless that. But don't think that the devil is going to like it. You folks are here on a Tuesday night. I see a lot of people that are gray-headed that have probably held on to the blood-stained banner a long time and are hoping to get that way to the finish line. Do you think the devil likes that? There's some young people in here, middle-aged people, moms and dads and young grandparents that are trying to keep their family in line on a Tuesday night in the house. Do you honestly think the devil likes that? So this is what Paul said. He said, Satan wants to get the advantage back over you. He said, we are not ignorant of his devices. How many of you had a mama that used the word ignorant? Surely my mama couldn't have been the only mama that called somebody ignorant. You know, there were stupid people and then there was ignorant people. You were something if mama called you stupid. You were a whole nother level if she called you ignorant. I'm telling you, I can still hear my mama talk about people that are ignorant. You know, mama talked about people like that. We didn't try to talk about them to their face. We always tried to do it behind their back so they didn't know that we were talking about it. But here's the way that mama, well, don't you act like y'all don't talk about people behind your back. Y'all just doing a group text message. Now, don't act like you don't do that. Here's the way that mama would deal with the two kinds of people. Stupid people in mama's eyes were the kind of people that knew better and they still did wrong. Ignorant people were the kind of people that didn't know better and did wrong. What did Paul say? He said, we're not ignorant. He said, we know how the devil operates. But brothers and sisters, I find among the people of God, we know how the devil operates, but we don't put two and two together. Things happen to us and the devil destroys the people of God. And we sit back and we say, I don't know how the devil got the advantage over me. 
How does the devil get the advantage? What are the devil's devices? I'll give you three of them that I wrote down right down here. If you don't understand how the devil operates among the people of God, in your family, among your children, in the house of God, you will be taken advantage of every single time. Three ways that the devil will get you. Number one, the first thing the devil loves to do is he loves to distract us. The devil loves to get our minds off of the main thing. Can I encourage you in what the main thing is? The main thing, it's not potluck dinners, and I love potluck dinners. It's not the main thing. The main thing is not blood drives, and I love blood drives, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is not giving gifts to children at Christmas, although I love giving gifts to children at Christmas. The main thing is not singing. The main thing is not preaching. Do you know what the main thing is? It is lifting up the name of Jesus Christ above all things. He is the only thing that matters. He's the only thing that's going to last. He's the only thing that's worth living for. So whenever we preach, if we preach to lift up the name of Jesus, we've done the main thing. If we sing and sing about the name of Jesus, we've sung about the main thing. If we give gifts in order to lift up the name of Jesus, we've done the main thing. But what does the devil love to do? He loves to distract us from the main thing. I hate doctors. I hate everything about doctors. I hate going to the doctor. I hate passing doctors. I hate paying doctor bills. I hate insurance about doctors. I hate everything about doctors. My little children have taken after me. My kids hate going to the doctor. They hate doctors. They hate nurses. They hate everything about There's one reason that we all despise going to the doctor. It's these little things called shots. I don't care how old you get. I hate shots. My little children coming along, having to get all them boosters and all them things like that. It was always a game, because my son, honest, his thighs are like tree trunks. Son, he'll break your nose if he ever gets a hold of it. And the doctor was always scared to death. So he'd say to me, Tyler, I need you to help me distract Mason. The problem with Mason, man, he was, like a, he was like a hunt dog that was locked on that doctor. That doctor would move. My son just watched him like this right here. He knew what was going on. You aren't getting one by my little three-year-old Mason. Mason was about two or three years old, and I took him to the doctor. And my, my, the doctor, the pediatrician, he said, he said, Tyler, here's what I want you to do. I want you to help me distract Mason. I said, good luck with that, doc. I said, he's been to your toy bin. He says, it's cheap. He's taking your stickers. He says, they're pitiful. He says, what are you? I said, what are you going to do to distract him? And he reached in his pocket, and he pulled out his car keys. And he threw them to me. I said, what do you want me to do with this? Hit him in the head? He said, no. Go over beside his ear. And jingle those keys. I said, you stupid. He said, do it. I started jingling those keys beside Mason's ear. And Mason was locked on that doctor, but he knew something was jangling beside him. And he kindly turned his head. He kindly cut them eyes over. And when he looked over, the way the light in the doctor's office was hitting those metal keys, it was shining. It would get that little shimmer. And I was jangling those keys, and Mason turned his entire head looking. And when he did, that doctor jabbed that shot in his thigh. And Mason was in shock. He couldn't believe he'd been had. But you know what? It was too late. The deed was already done. And that, that potion, whatever that, doc, that, that medicine was, was already in his bloodstream. Had that mess get in his bloodstream, he got distracted by something that was unintelligible, the jangling of the keys and something that was shiny. It really wasn't real, it just looked real. That's what the devil does in our church. We hear things in our lives and they start pulling our ears aside. We're coming to the house of God and we think about worship in the name of Jesus and then the devil whispers something about so and so that's up there singing and before we know it we've taken our eyes and our ears off of what they're saying, thinking about the lie that the devil's put in our ears and then we hear something that the preacher is 
is saying. And the next thing we know, we're thinking something about the preacher. And then we go to lunch and instead of thinking about how good God is and how great God is, we're thinking about all those distracting lies. Honey, I'm telling you, the devil is a master manipulator and he knows how to distract you. He knows how to get your mind off the subject. He knows how to pull your attention away. You say, Tyler, what do I do? The apostle Paul remembered what the Lord Jesus said. Here's how you deal with something. If the devil puts something in your mind about somebody, don't think about it. You go right to that person like Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 19 and you say, I heard such and such about you. You go to them face to face. And if it ain't big enough to go face to face, then throw it out of your mind because a devil is a liar and the father of lies. Do not let him distract you from the main thing. Can I ask you a question? God's blessed us the last several days. But there are people in this room right now that have had so much on their mind, you ain't even been able to focus on one thing going on. And God had to let the devil blow the sound system to pot in order for you to focus because the devil loves to distract. The second way that the devil loves to devour the people of God, he loves to divide us. He loves to drive a wedge right in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, he loves for somebody on this side to be mad on somebody right in here. And he loves for people in here to think things about people over there. He loves for y'all to think things about him. And he loves for y'all to think things about him. He wants you to think that they're the problem up there. He wants them to think they're the problem down here. Because if he can divide us, there is no unity. And brothers and sisters, where there is no unity, the Holy Spirit will not abide. Because the Spirit of God will not feel a divided body. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how else to say this other than just to say it. I've never been accused of being a liar, but sometimes I am far too honest. I don't know any other way to say this. If you get more than two people in a room, you're going to have more than one opinion. You're going to have more than one way of doing things. You don't think that they know everything. They don't think they know everything. and They don't think they know everything. They don't think he knows everything. He don't think they know everything. Y'all don't think he knows everything. And guess what? Every single one of you are right. There are a thousand ways to do everything and you're not right about everything and you're not wrong about everything. You don't think that this is good. You don't think that's bad. You don't think they're this and you don't think they're that. Honey, at the end of the day, not one thing that we think about anybody is going to matter. There is only one thing that matters. I want to ask you a question. How many of you tonight believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven and you have asked him to be your Lord and Savior? Stick your hand up in the air. If your hand is raised right now, you are my brother and you are my sister. And the only thing that matters at the end of the day is are we in the same family? I don't like your music. Well, I don't like you. You know something I have found? It really doesn't matter what I like. It only matters what Jesus likes. And the last time I checked... You ain't his mouthpiece. If he don't like something, he'll be sure to tell it. You know something I have found? Boy, I'm telling you, I used to know everything. When I first started in this thing, I knew everything. You wanted something known, you ask me. If you want to know how to do something, you ask me. If you want to know if a song's a good song, you ask me. If you want to know if a good way to preach is a good way to preach, you ask me. Man, I had an opinion about everything. How many of you remember when you first got started in everything? You knew everything about everything. But doesn't life have a way of taking your knowledge out of your head? Am I the only one that every day I live, I'm less smart than I was the day before? Yeah. And you know what I'm learning to appreciate? If everybody was the same He wouldn't be a very big God. The fact that we're all different means that He is a mighty, wise God. Some of y'all didn't like that point. Let me back up and hit her again. On my body right now, I have a right index finger. And I have a right middle finger. And I have a right ring finger. And I have a right pinky finger. And on my right foot, I have a right big toe. And I have a right toe beside that. 
And I don't know what the next toe is, but I got one of those right beside that. And I got another toe right beside that. And then I got a pinky toe on my right foot. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here is the way that our bodies would look if Baptists had their way about it. We would have a big toe on our pinky finger, and we would have a pinky finger where our big toe goes. You know why? Because we think if somebody doesn't look like us and act like us and have the same opinions as us and have the same likes as us and have the same everything as us, then they must be wrong. That doesn't make them wrong. It just means they're different, and they're a different part of the body. But at the end of the day, every part of my body body is put there for a reason and when all the parts of the body are operating in sync that's what God desired because when you got every different part coming together under one unified body that is the head that's over them all ladies and gentlemen you may be white black red green purple blue poor rich skinny fat it doesn't matter what you are if you are operating in your gift then you matter to God and you matter to me don't let the devil divide you. You know how the devil rips marriages apart? He gets a wife thinking because the husband is different from her and he gets the husband thinking because the husband doesn't think what you think is important isn't important. He divides. Can I tell y'all something? She ain't here so I can just go ahead and tell it, tell it on her. My wife, I, I'm more of what we call the free spirit type. I wake up every day and I'll figure it out. I don't really operate in the plan thing. I'm not really what I'd call an organized guru. In fact, I have a calendar and I have a secretary, but I don't listen to them. My wife has got her life planned out to the millisecond. I think she knows when she's going to die. I really do. I can't prove it, but I think the girl knows when she's going to die. She gets so mad at me because I don't plan everything. And I get so mad at her because she won't live in the moment. Who's right and who's wrong? When two operate in their strengths, you have an entire marriage. Can I ask you a question to your husband or wife? Have you let the devil bring something between the two of you? Because you didn't see eye to eye on it. When you don't see eye to eye on a thing, it's because you're focused on the wrong thing. Dividing. Number three, do you know the third way the devil loves to tear us up? The very last one is he loves to discourage us do you know how the devil discourages you he discourages you with three things he'll tell you one of three things that'll tear your nerves up the first thing he'll tell you is you can't he'll show you your inability he'll show you how it's not possible he'll show you how it's never going to happen he'll show you how you don't have the strength to do it how you don't have the know how to do it how you don't have the wisdom to do it the second thing that he'll say he won't only say you can't he'll say God won't He'll tell you that your prayers aren't making a difference. He'll tell you it doesn't matter how many times you get on your face. It'll tell you, he'll tell you it doesn't matter how many things you try to put in place. God's not going to move that mountain. God's not going to give you the strength to cross that river. God's not going to give you the ability to do all that. He'll say you can't. He'll say God won't. And then the third thing he'll say is you're not making a difference. You see, he'll tell somebody in a church, it doesn't matter if you come. It doesn't matter if you don't come. It doesn't matter if you show up. It doesn't matter if you don't show up. You're not making a difference in those kids' lives. It it doesn't matter if you give up everything to live for those children. You're not going to make a difference in their life. You're not going to do this. He'll tell you those things over and over and over. And he loves to discourage people. Why? Have we ever thought about why the devil loves to discourage people? I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story about the devil when he had a going out of business sale, Pastor. Brother Anthony, he had a going out of business sale one day and he decided he was getting out of the market. He was getting out of everything. He was throwing his tools away. He was done with it all. Pastor Mike, he had a, had a yard sale at the very gates of hell and out in front of the gates of hell he had a big long table spread out with all of his tools and invited the general public to come if they wanted to get into the market. So this old boy went down there one day, Steve, and he got down there, and there wasn't anybody out there, so he was just perusing the tools, and he looked at the first tool on the table, 
And I mean it was a bad looking tool. It had belts and it had hoses and it had blades all over. And he turned it over and it was the tool of adultery. And it was a bad looking tool. He could see how that tool of adultery had done so much damage. But when he turned the price tag over, it really was pretty fairly priced considering how powerful it was. He went down the table and tool after tool, the next tool was the tool of drunkenness. And I mean it was a bad looking tool, but not very far out of somebody's price range. And he got all the way down. And when he got down to the end of the table, at the end of the table was the smallest tool of them all. It was a wedge. You know those kind of wedges, men, whenever you're chopping down a tree and you go to stick the wedge in the crevice of the tree to push it in a direction? He turned this tool over and the paint was all gone off of it. It was worn and torn. He turned the tag over, but it wasn't labeled what it was. When he turned the tag back over, it had to be a price problem because it was the most expensive tool on the whole table. So he took the tool and he went to the gates of hell and he got to the door and he knocked on the door and the devil came to the door and he looked at him and he said, Mr. Devil, he said, can I ask you a question? I understand all these tools, but what is this tool and why is it so expensive and why is it so worn down? And the devil looked at him and he said, man, let me tell you something. That's the most valuable tool that I have and I've used it on absolutely everybody. The man said, what is that tool? He said, it's called the tool of discouragement. He said, let me tell you how it operates. He said, I'll go up to somebody and the cracks and crevices of their heart are so tight I can't pour my poisons in. I can't use my other tools. But what I'll do is I'll find the smallest area of their life and I'll take that wedge of discouragement and I'll start driving it in. And I'll start telling them how they don't matter. I'll start telling them how they're not making a difference. I'll start telling them how they're never going to accomplish anything. I'll start telling them how it doesn't matter what they do. I'll start telling them how life is never going to be the same. And what happens is I open up their heart with that discouragement. And once I get them so opened up with discouragement, I can pour any poison I want into their life. Child of God, you may be here tonight and the devil's got you so down. He's got you so discouraged. Your mind is so torn up. It is a lie from the very pits of hell. And And what you need to understand, the devil only fights what the devil fears. And if he's come after you, there is something God's about to do in your life. There's something God's about to accomplish in your life. You can't throw in the towel. You can't give up even when the devil discourages you. So here's the question. How do you beat the devil? I'll give you three things, and I mean I'm out of here. I'm going back to that Cobb County diner that I ate at last night. Son, I got two pieces of meatloaf that absolutely shut down three ventricles of my heart, but I have never felt so good eating it. How in the world do you beat the devil? Number one, the first thing you do, the Bible says you must resist the devil. You know what's amazing to me? The Bible says that when we come up against temptation, we are to flee temptation. We're not to even deal with it. But when the devil starts pushing back and making those accusations about our life, you know what he tells us to do? He says, resist the devil. Here is something you need to put in practice that we as Baptists, I don't know where in the world we missed the boat, but we have missed the boat. Here's what happens. When you have those moments in your life when the discouragement starts coming at you, do you know what that means? God wants you to start pushing back against that discouragement. So what do you do? Here's what you do. Whatever the devil is saying to you that is discouraging you, you got to flip that thing around on its head and start pushing back. Whenever the devil tells you you're not making a difference in the church you start pushing back and say by the power of Jesus Christ I am making a difference in the church of Jesus Christ when he starts telling you that God's not going to hear your prayers you start pushing back saying my God will give me whatsoever I desire and ask in the name of Jesus whenever the devil tells you he's not going to turn your marriage around you look the devil in the eyeball and start pushing him back saying my God is big enough and powerful enough to make an end an impact in my marriage. Whatever he tells you, you've got to start pushing back and resist the devil. Boy, I got, my son is almost 13 years old and he's a chunk. He's huge. I call him Little Hoss. 
He's got little tree trunks for thighs. You know, when my son was just a, just a small thing, I'd push him around everywhere. We'd just wrestle. Man, we pretended like we were WWE, man. We'd, just, we'd come off the top turnbuckle. I'd get out there in my shorts and no shirt acting like mean Gene Okerlund, and I'd just get out there and act like a fool. I'd come off the top turnbuckle. I'd push him around. I'd throw him around. I'd push him here. I'd push him there. I'd knock his head over. I'd push him up against the bed. I'd body slam him. I mean, I'd put him in a DDT. I'd stone cold stun him. Don't y'all rednecks act like you don't know what I'm talking about. I know what y'all do every Monday night. But something happened. He started getting older and bigger. And he started fighting back. The other day I was messing with him. He's so funny. And I pushed him. And you know what that meant? It's go time. You know what that fool did? He pushed me back. And it hurt. So I thought, no, you ain't going to get to one up on me. So I went at him. Put him in a Got him, got him in a, a lockup. He wrapped his arms around my head. He locked up on me. I tried to push away from him. Now, brothers and sisters, here's what happened. We got to fighting. I got a bruise the size of 45, 50 cent pieces right here on my thigh. I mean, he beat the ever-loving devil right out of me. But here's what happened. It wasn't nearly as much fun, and it didn't last nearly as long when he started fighting back. Here's what you're going to find about the devil. When you start pushing back on the devil, that attack won't last nearly as long. Whenever the devil tells you something about somebody else in the house of God or the family of God, and you start pushing back on him and say, No, I don't believe that about so-and-so. I refuse to believe that. You'll find the attack stops. When you learn to resist the devil. When the devil tells you you don't matter, look the devil in the eyeballs and say this, I mattered enough to God to bankrupt heaven and send Jesus Christ from the palaces of glory to make his way down the Milky Way to dance across the solar system and to condescend down into the very womb of a virgin to live 33 years of a holy perfect life and to die on Golgotha's hill whenever he could have called legions of angels he looked up to the father and said father forgive him for he knows not what he does I matter enough to God to die you start pushing back you'll find the attack ceases quickly. you got to learn to start resisting the devil. You say, Tyler, I'm worried about something. Anxiety is always the red flag. It's time to pray. What we often do with worry and anxiety is we let it dwell in our head. Don't y'all act. Some of y'all are sucking down so much Prozac you can't even see straight. We let anxiety overwhelm us. We all have stuff to worry about. You're never going to get to the place where you don't worry. But worry is always the lights and siren that it's time to get on your knees and seek the face of God. Resist the devil. Number two, you need to write this down. How in the world do you get victory over the devil? You've got to remember this. Christ is our victory. Jesus Christ is our victory. Brothers and sisters, I wish I could tell you I'd never made a mistake. I wish I could tell you I had never messed up. I wish I could tell you that I had not let God down. I wish I could tell you that I'd never had a wrong thought. I wish I could tell you I didn't have a mess up. I wish I could tell you I had never fallen down. I wish I could tell you I had always prayed about everything. But I'd be a lie if I said that. I have messed up and I have fallen down and I haven't prayed about everything. But at the end of the day, the devil would love for me to believe that those things have taken me out of the favor of God. That's not the way that it operates. It's not my ability that keeps me in God's good, God's good grace. It's not my will and my desire and my praying that keeps me in the favor of God. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know what makes God love me? It's not me, but it's at the right hand of God the Father. I've got an advocate. I've got a mediator. I've got an intercessor, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my victory. It doesn't matter what happens to me. Brothers and sisters, the devil would love for you
to think that because you did not, God won't. How many of you have children? Children, you have children. I, I have, I've got two. You probably have one, two, three, some of you, four, five. How many of you know there is nothing your children can do to make you love them any less? If your children did the worst thing possible, they would still be welcome at your table. I can tell you right now, my son could slap me in the face. But because he's my blood, I'd still give him something to eat if he was hungry. If my daughter spit on me, it would shatter my heart, but it would not change my heart. Brothers and sisters, you've got to understand at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you're battling. It doesn't matter how you feel. You are accepted because of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not your good ways. It's not your good will. Jesus Christ is our victory. He is our advocate. He is our mediator. He is the one that stands in the gap for us. And no matter what I do, no matter where I go, no matter how I operate, no matter how the devil messes me up, up, I can stand up every day and say by the good blood of the Lord Jesus Christ I am redeemed and I am forgiven and I am accepted because of Jesus Christ and when you have that assurance when you fall down you gladly get back up because you know the Father is still there we've believed too many lies we have believed far too many issues. Listen to me. I wish I could tell you I had always prayed every time I should pray, Pastor. It'd be a lie. I wish I could tell you that I had always studied and really sought the face of God. But every time I go back, I find Him there. Do you know why He's always there? Because the one who is tattooed on my heart, the Lamb of God is always there. Amen. And Paul said this, even when I fail, yet he abideth faithful. At the end of the day, my victory is in Jesus Christ, not in me, but in him. Amen. Let me give you number three. How in the world do you beat the devil? Number three, you've got to rely on the Holy Spirit. You've got to rely on the Holy Ghost. I have no idea where that phrase, Holy Ghost, started bothering Baptist. We have lost our minds. We absolutely do not understand what it means to walk in the Spirit of God. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? It means to always be acting and thinking and talking like Jesus Christ. That's what it means. Brothers and sisters, listen. You cannot win if you're constantly relying on your ways, your mind, and your thoughts. You know, God will ask you to do the craziest stuff sometimes. Craziest stuff. Can I tell y'all a crazy story? If y'all promise to believe me. I done told you, I ain't gonna lie to you like most preachers. Most preachers just make stuff up. I ain't gonna lie to you. I ain't gonna make it up. We've got a television ministry. We've been trying to get on in Atlanta. In fact, back in July, time out, this is my second time out. Back in, back in July, the, the Sunday before the 4th of July, we were Saturday night before the 4th of July, we had bought prime time spots all over America from Washington, D.C. to Miami to Atlanta, Greensboro, Birmingham, Tuscaloosa. Uh, we'd gone over to San Antonio, into Houston. And we had procured time in Atlanta on CBS at 7.30 or 8 o'clock on CBS in Atlanta. We sent them the program. We didn't talk. We, we pre, I, I think the message that I preached was uh, something about Jesus Christ. Being, it was nothing political. It was nothing like that mentioned. And they looked at us and sent back and said, I'm sorry, we will not put this on our station. I remember thinking, what? so we've had this TV ministry. We've got it now, and, and God's blessed, and God's growing, and people have just been, been wonderful. Okay. One day I, I, I woke up and 
All I could think about was West Virginia. West Virginia. I ain't lost nothing in West Virginia. I don't even like going to West Virginia. If you're from West Virginia, don't get offended. You left. <laughs> There's always a West Virginia native that gets offended. You ain't there no more. Now listen, all I could think about was West Virginia. That's all I could think about. So I started praying and God started laying on me to, 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 to buy television time in Bluefield, West Virginia. Bluefield, West Virginia. Not even like the popular place in West Virginia. I want you to think of country redneck and go right. That's Bluefield. I've been to Bluefield, preached in Bluefield, sweetest people, but man, they country as cornbread. So we bought time. And you know what I thought? I thought we're fixing to have a great revival. I don't know why, but I'm obeying God, and we're going to have revival in Bluefield, and God's going to send God's going to send revival to the place where the coal miner's daughter was at. I mean, I'm excited. It's going to be fantastic. I don't know if the coal miner's daughter were there, but anyways. And so it's going to be wonderful. You know, for seven months, do you know how many letters and emails and cards and gifts and dollar bills and support came into our ministry from Bluefield, West Virginia? Are you ready? None! Seven months. After about eight or nine months, I started really, I'll be honest, I lost interest in Bluefield, West Virginia. It was like God just took it out of my heart. So after about 10 or 11 months, I don't remember what it was, we called the station and said, we're going to pull our program from your station and you know, we'll, we'll pray and see what God wants. I had peace. I knew I was in God's will. Two years went by. This past April, we stepped out and we're doing all this stuff by faith and God's blessing and we had a $7,000 need. We had to buy a piece of, of camera equipment and everything I've ever done, I've tried to do it by faith. So I got on my knees one day and I prayed and I said, God, we need $7,000 that we don't have. And I got up, several days went by, Erica went to the post office and in the post office was a letter. Open up the letter and in it was a check for $7,000. I thought, praise God and the Lamb forevermore. I got back down. I said, Lord, I need 107. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> I opened the letter, and the check had the address from Bluefield, West Virginia. And I read the letter. I still have the letter. The letter was from a lady, and this was the gist of the letter. That's what she said. She said, Pastor, you don't know me. But two years ago, my husband was diagnosed with cancer. And our doctor told us because of COVID that if he got sick at all because of the chemo, he wouldn't make it. So for nine months, we stayed home. And every Sunday, your television program was our church service. She said, Pastor, we don't have the internet and the only church we got was your 30 minutes on Sunday. My husband only lasted for nine months. He died and she named the date. The week after was the week that I called the television station. She said, Pastor... My husband didn't have much, but he had a tractor that he loved with all of his heart. And he's been gone now for a year, and the last thing that I had to sell was his tractor. And I sold his tractor the other day, and he told me he wanted to go to Tyler. I sold his tractor for $7,000. The devil beat my brains out when I had that need. I didn't have a clue where it'd be coming from. I didn't have a clue what would happen. 
But because way back yonder, I did something that everybody told me was crazy. Everybody told me would fail. Everybody told me would mess up. Because I obeyed the leadership of the Spirit of God, the devil was defeated. I don't have an invitation other than this. If you want to beat the devil, you're going to have to start doing these three things. Thank you for watching this broadcast of Unspeakable Joy with Pastor Tyler Galden. Our prayer is that you have been challenged and changed by the power of God's Word. Unspeakable Joy is only able to broadcast on this station through the regular prayers and financial support of people just like you. We thank you for your faithful support. For more information, visit us online. To request the full sermon from this broadcast, call us at 833-FULL-JOY or write us at Unspeakable Joy, P.O. Box 4558, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27404. All of our sermons and other resources are available online. Be assured that God's Word has the answer for your every need, that you may rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory.